One of the things about a book series like Foundation is that it is incredibly complex and it is really difficult to adapt something like this. More so, I would argue that Foundation is more complex than Middle Earth in a lot of ways, um, maybe even more complex than Dune. And I know that book purists um, have a lot to say about this show, um, but I would also urge people to take Brandon Sanderson's approach to adaptations and understand that you're never going to be able to take the complexity of a book series and render that word for word into a visual format, especially when you're talking long form television or a film series, um, because you're dealing with things that take place over hundreds of pages and you have to condense that. But also in the case of this, you're dealing with thousands of years of time how do you deal with that? I mean, you could go the Rings of Power route and try to condense everything into a, you know, s several hundred year period as opposed to letting it, you know, marinate over the course of, you know, thousands of years across seasons. I am not a book purist, so I can look at things like, you know, Rings of Power and I can critique, but I ultimately appreciate it being an adaptation, much like Brandon Sanderson talks about, you know, needing to understand the validity of the adaptation and go along with it. And Foundation is a complex show, and this first episode of season two, if you've never, if you haven't watched season one, I have a feeling that you're going to be completely lost with season two, which is an unfortunate first step for the sophomore season, because in some ways you want to be able to bring more people into the fold who maybe didn't watch the first season. But if, you know, if you don't do that right, your audience isn't going to expand. So I think that's going to be a struggle for this show a little bit given the fact that it is extremely complex and there's a lot going on in the first season that isn't really talked about in season one. We're just kind of dumped into it. Now, I'm saying all of that because it's a spoiler-free... This is the spoiler-free part of the episode because everything that comes after this is absolutely spoiled. So if you don't want things spoiled, make sure to go away and watch the episode first, then come back and watch this. You have been warned. I'm going to do a countdown now for those of you who need it so that you have plenty of time to walk away five four three two one and you've had your warning everything after this point is fair game so yeah this is a freaking amazing episode uh i absolutely loved the first season i loved this episode I don't remember much about season one because it's been a while and I didn't watch any refreshers. So when I first sat down to watch this episode and I was going through the early stages, I was trying to remember, and I don't remember all the things, but I did remember a lot of the major points as we got deeper into it, which is great. But I am going to hold that critique that I talked about before the spoiler alert, which is that they're going to have a hard time bringing new people into the show if, you know, because of that. Now, I do realize that they published sort of a Here's what happened in season one. Go watch this first. And I think that that's something that is a good idea to do, a synopsis, as it were. And I know Netflix has done that with some of their shows in the past as well. Like when they come into a second or third season, they'll have a synopsis of what came before. Um, and I probably should have watched that myself before I get into this. But I think I've got a good enough grasp to sort of cover this from a high-level perspective for the episode. One of the things that I really love at the beginning is, is Harry Seldon is there's multiple things going on here because there's a couple of copies of him at this point. There's the, I think the, if I understand things correctly, there's the original copy, which, which Gail um, captured and contained in this prime radiant, which I don't remember what that is. I think it's, it's like a mathematical equation type box thing where she captured his consciousness. Then there's the digital version that's, there's the copy that's stored in the vault, which is where the foundation headquarters is. Um, if I'm remembering this correctly, but this this when we get the ep opening sequence with with Harry in the Prime Radiant prison, he's losing his mind. He doesn't understand what's going on, and he's trying to figure it all out. But he gives this line of dialogue that I thought was incredibly potent, and I had to write it down. But it says, um, I'm gonna go go over to my notes here. It says, "God's made wine to compensate those who cannot afford revenge." And I I read that line. 
All right, or I heard that line, and I had to pause the episode and write it down. I was like, that is a brilliant line of dialogue, signifying that only the rich and the wealthy and the powerful can afford revenge. The rest of us, we just have to drink wine to cope. <laughs> you know, and I was like, that's actually, that's a, that's a pretty potent uh, line of dialogue. Um, so there's multiple things going on here, just like there was in the first season, and that's one of the things that's difficult with this, is that it's incredibly complex, and we're weaving together multiple storylines across, here's the kicker, centuries of time and we'll get into millennia at some point um i i gotta say that um one of the things i i really love about this is lee pace's performance as brother day who is the the actual emperor so there's three versions obviously you have the the young version who is known as, and you know, I should take a step back. Remember, that if you haven't watched this yet, the Emperor is a clone. And it's been generations now, and the Emperor, the Empire has been governed by this clone for a long time. And the clone has three, so there's three stages to this. There's Brother Dusk, Brother Dawn, and yeah, Brother Dawn, Brother Day, Brother Dusk. I had to read that in order so brother dawn is a young version brother day is the actual person who governs the emperor that's played by lee pace and brother dusk who is the old version and basically these clones go through their life cycles and brother dawn will eventually become the next brother day and this brother day will eventually become the next brother dusk unless something happens and there's an assassination or something like that and there is an assassination attempt. Um, Brother Day is having some hoochie coochie with his uh, with his android protector slash I forget exactly what she is. And there's an assassination attempt. And I gotta say, I am a heterosexual male. And Lee Pace is I have to I have to give him credit because he is in incredible shape and has taken very good care of himself. And I, this scene where he is, it's it's almost like if you remember when Viggo Mortensen had, had that naked fight scene in the in the sauna in uh, a history. What, no, it wasn't History of Violence. It was the other one that he did with um, Cronenberg. Oh, why am I blanking? It's the one where it's like the Russian mob, and I can't remember the name of it off. Oh, Eastern Promises or something like that. Um, this is reminiscent of that because Lee Pace has this fight scene where he's copulating with his android and assassins come in and he's naked and he is just it's so awesome because he's in his prime and he's taking great care of himself and you're just marveling at the the sculpting of lee pace's body but then you're also marveling at how competent brother day is at martial arts and defending himself and everything else but then when he realizes that his personal aura is gone, the the defense shield that keeps him from being harmed and they actually shoot him in the shoulder and then they slice his chest get a neurotoxin in him and they almost kill him um that fight sequence is great you know like they cut the half of the android's head off but she still survives and manages to take brother day and dump him in the neuro tank and get him you know saves his life but now he's sus- you know brother day is suspecting everybody at this point he even suspects his two brothers dawn and dusk and wants them to submit to questioning and in the midst of all of this he's entertaining the idea of marrying this um this queen of another nation. I don't remember how that played into the first season. There's complexities here. Lee Pace is a brilliant actor. I loved him as Thranduil in in Lord of the Rings uh, Hobbit films. But he's done a a bunch of stuff over the years. He's an extremely talented actor. But I also got to say, and I can say this with with a straight face and with with all sincerity, I don't like to, you know, I feel like guys like Henry Cavill oftentimes and, and Lee Pace, you know, People want to overly sexualize him. I, I'm not looking at this in a sexual nature, but I am looking at, at him and saying, this guy has busted his ass to get in that great of shape. He's a very handsome fellow, and he has done a great job, and he's not only a brilliant actor, but anybody who's willing to put themselves through that those paces. You know, Chris Hemsworth is another good example. These guys are Olympic-level, you know, athletes to a degree. Um, for their craft, and it's it's pretty amazing because I'm not a bodybuilder, and and I've I've gone to the gym um, in Mexico City when we were there for four years. I spent about two years going to the gym, like six days a week. I put on about 25 pounds of muscle, and for the first time in my life, I got down to where I was starting to get a little bit of a six pack, not a lot, but a little bit, and and it felt good. But I mean, 
that was two years of work to get me to that point. And guys like this who live this lifestyle, you got to, you got to, you know, give them credit. You know, obviously they're getting paid for it and they have personal trainers and dietitians and everything else, but works. Um, What's up, everybody? Quick commercial break here to give it a shout out to our guild champions, who are the highest tier memberships here on YouTube. Ancient Entity, Assassin Gamer 94, Bubblonia Rising, Crazy's Relative, Mujin, and Remedy. Thanks so much for the highest tier membership. And thanks to all of the members who support the channel, because you keep me doing this full time. You too can become a supporter if you're new here. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell icon so you never miss an update. Join as a member. There's three different tiers. We do lots of special stuff, private polls, private videos you get a shout out if you're the highest tier membership but you can also do one-off uh, donations in the form of super chats on any live stream or premiere you see and of course super thanks on any upload or youtube short whatever you can contribute it's great keeps me on the air full time keeps the cats fed keeps the homestead running anyway back to the video everybody his performance as Brother Day is great. The imperial nature, the pose when he's on the throne and he's like sprawled out in that sort of Emperor Nero vibe. Um, and also very ruthless, you know. It's, it's a very interesting POV. I don't remember what's going on with the genetic stuff, the genetic error in, in, in the Emperor's Code. So that part was kind of confusing to me and I don't recall that. Um, but that's just one subplot. The other subplot is... Salvor and, and Gail, or Gaul, I forget who's Gail, um, which is Salvor's the daughter and Gail's the mother, but they were in a time sleep for like 138 years and they're sort of connecting and Gail's got the prison box with, with Harry in it. And basically, Gail's whole thing is, or yeah, Gail's whole thing is like she sees that, that Harry's path isn't working. There was the first big event. And now the paths have diverged from where it was supposed to go, and they have to figure out how to fix the next big event. Otherwise, things are going to be really, really bad. Um, meanwhile, we do get a brief glimpse of like the Foundation headquarters, and the vault is opening up, and everybody's been waiting for 138 years since the last appearance of Harry Seldon and his copy. So they know he's about to appear and give them some information about the next crisis they're, they're about to face. And the whole thing, the whole theme here is war war is on the horizon and one of the things i'd forgotten about at the end and i don't remember exactly how this worked at the end of the first season but i remember there was a subplot of that ship that they found that the somebody found that was like these subsect of foundationists or something they got a warship and they faked this event on the edge of space to make it look like there had been a sun flare or something and basically you know had the empire think that they had been destroyed and the Empire has been, you know, spending the last 138 years thinking that the Foundation had gone away, when in reality it's been building and fleshing out and being successful over the last 138 years because that was Harry Seldon's design. But war was inevitable, and war is probably going to be a major aspect of this season, if I had to guess, especially given the fact that they just point blank mention it in this episode. So, um, overall. I got to give this a, a, a really good rating for just for the fun and the pacing and everything else. Visually, man, Apple TV is pulling out all the stops on this one because visually this is one of the best looking science fiction things I've ever seen on television. It is absolutely phenomenal, The all the VFX shots, and it's just a visually stunning show. The score is pretty good. The writing is obviously great. The acting is amazing. Jared Harris is just, as Harry Seldon, like, um, hope I didn't butcher his name. Um, anyway, he's brilliant, um, and you can hear his father's voice um, in, in as he's gotten older. You can hear that coming out in him, which is really cool to see a generational actor of, of his caliber. Anyway, at the end of the day, you know, I got to give this – I would give it a 10 out of 10 except for one thing. The fact that they there's just no easy way to bring new viewers into – the second season like this so given the complexity of everything else i feel like you know uh, drop it down to an eight out of ten because they didn't you know, do any sort of you know like easing people into it they just sort of drop you in and and you have to kind of figure it out as you go along and if you haven't watched season one you're gonna have no clue about who all these characters are or what's going on so 
that knocks it down a couple of pegs. But if it weren't for that, I would have given it a 10 out of 10 because it's just phenomenal. Like I said, I'm not a book purist, so I really don't give a shit if this isn't following the books. It's a highly – I've read the books, and they're good, but again – even more complex than this show, and I think they've done an admirable job of taking that source material and adapting it for the screen. And I know some people are going to be like, it's not accurate. It's like, you know, you, you critiqued Rings of Power. Why aren't you critiquing this? If you remember my Rings of Power reviews, I also said that despite the fact that they weren't following the lore, it was still, a, you know, in some ways a good show. Uh, my wife gave it, gave it an 8 out of 10. She's never read the books, you know, but she was entertained, and I am entertained by this and that's the most important thing for me everybody love to hear your thoughts like subscribe hit that bell icon drop your comments down below and i'll see everybody in the next episode happy viewing